And good afternoon again. We are back for our second edition of uh, the Lived Black Experience uh, broadcast. Um, just a few moments ago, we had a, a very nice discussion with our book club uh, leader, Sister Dr. Margaret Boatwright, who uh, led us through a discussion of uh, two books for our April read, uh, Native Son and The Fire Next Time. And uh, so now we're back with uh, a deep topic of protests uh, and why uh, Black people uh, in particular, why we protest, what happens when we protest, um, how is that perceived when we protest. And Sister Kara, first of all, good afternoon. Um, you know, I was thinking as we were coming up on this topic, um, how far do Black protests go and um, I'm excited to hear what Dr. Green um, enlightens us about today. But to me, um, I think when um, our ancestors, um, when some of them jumped off the, those ships during the Middle Passage, um, and locked arms together. I think that's a that was a major protest. Um, and and um, you know the few uh, plantation uprisings um, that have occurred. So I, I'm excited because that I mean to me I think those could those incidents could be protests. We will not be rather than be enslaved we'll we'll die and and we'll die together and then those plantation uprisings um where we no longer will live this way what do you think i agree i agree 100 percent. i think we have been protesting for as long as we have been here and before, yeah. uh, like you yeah. said, back to <laughs> going back to the ships, we did not go quietly into that exactly. dark. Exactly. Uh, but uh, I'm I'm really interested to see what Dr. Green will share about the history of Black protest, the definitions of Black protest, um, and and looking at you know, like you said, why it's reacted and responded to in the ways that it is. So. Exactly. Yeah. So with that being said, we turn the platform over to you. All right. Thank you so much. And welcome to everyone who is joining us today. Uh, as we were just saying, we are excited to bring this conversation to you and dive into this conversation. Uh, giving our presentation today is Dr. Tara T. Green. Dr. Green is the Linda Carlisle Excellence Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies and Professor and former Director of African American and African Diaspora Studies at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. She is the author of four books, A Fatherless Child, Autobiographical Perspectives of African American Men, winner of the 2011 Outstanding Scholarship in Africana Studies Award from the National Council for Black Studies, Reimagining the Middle Passage, Black Resistance in Literature, Television, and Song, and two forthcoming books, See Me Naked, Black Women Defining Pleasure During the Interwar Era, and Love, Activism, and the Respectable Life of Alice Dunbar Nelson. She is also the editor of two books, From the Plantation to the Prison, African American Confinement Literature, and Presenting Oprah Winfrey, Her Films in African American Literature. Moving beyond the classroom, she has received recognition for her work as a mentor and for her service in African-American studies. Dr. Green is also past president of the Langston Hughes Society and co-editor of Mercer University Press's Voices of the African Diaspora series. Welcome, Dr. Green. Thank you all for inviting me to come back and to share with you. Um, 
When I presented on March 14th, I talked about the Middle Passage and its representation in Black art, namely in Alex Haley's Roots, which many of us are familiar with. This presentation is linked in succinct ways to that March 14th presentation. Today, I will draw upon the Middle Passage as a source that makes protests and resistance by people of African descent necessary from one generation to the next. Here I discuss the reasons for protests and kinds of protests. First of all, let me begin by answering the question, what is the Middle Passage? Because it is vital for us to understand that. The Middle Passage is a mappable geographical site a watery pathway over a vast ocean that would be the Atlantic Ocean that people use, primarily um, people of, of Europe, use to transport goods from Africa, Europe, and the Caribbean, and the Americas. African descendants in America owe our existence largely to the survival of those Africans who were brought through the Middle Passage, the journey between West Africa and the Americas. I see the Middle Passage as extended past that transatlantic slave trade that ended in the 19th century. Scholar Michelle Wright argues that it is this continuity that is the problem, the linking of events through a logic bound by cause and effect that ties the past to the present and provides direction for the future. Here, I am interested in that cause and effect. I agree that during the time of the transatlantic slave trade or the middle passage that um, is of most concern here, African captives facing unbelievable, unexpected, strange, and foreign threats would have come to value their lives even more. In this state of understanding, African captives' resistance to this new experience was inevitable. African descendant artists, revisions, and their reimaginings seek to make legible what is untranslatable the painful, the emotional. What they do is they isolate and narrow moments in the middle passage where the humanity of African captive clashes with the inhumane acts of white supremacy. Under white supremacy, Africans and their descendants were perceived as what scholar Orlando Patterson called socially dead non-persons. I'll say that again, socially dead non-persons. A non-person is treated and perceived as not being worthy of equal treatment. We have so many examples. For example, a non-person does not have access to education or clean water to drink and to bathe in. What about well-paying jobs, health care, or they're not worthy of being saved from disasters as we saw with Katrina. Non-persons are treated like a body that is dispensable and replaceable by yet another body. That non-person is undeserving of access and in too many cases deserving of a violent death or killing if that body refuses to work or to follow the rules, whatever those rules may be. These bodies are seen as criminal, as deviant, in need of controlling. In response, some may also come to think of themselves as inferior or as a non-person. However, treatment based on the perception that leads to this status of social death means that one considered a socially dead non-person has to either accept this status or not accept it. In fact, reject it. 
perhaps protest against it. And today, I illuminate the moments and various forms of rejection and resistance expressed by African descendants when their lives are threatened and their humanity is negated. Resistance to captivity occurred often and in some cases, as soon as Africans were taken from their homes and then dragged aboard ships on the African coast. In a comprehensive study of shipboard insurrections by African captives, scholar Eric Robert Taylor finds that there were hundreds, he states, perhaps even thousands of incidents that took place throughout the history of the slave trade. He goes on to note that he found at least 400 cases that occurred in the 18th century alone. And that he says, it is highly likely that revolts of varying magnitude occurred on slave ships at least once a month on average. And we know one of the most well-known, the Amistad case. Some of you all may remember the film. The facts are in violation of international treaties that were in place in 1839, Africans were taken from Sierra Leone on a ship bound for Cuba. And during the voyage, the enslaved killed the ship's captain and a crewman, and crewman. Not knowing how to properly navigate those enslaved veered off their destination, their desired destination, and ended up off the coast of New York, where they were seized and detained until U.S. courts decided who had authority over their rights. A remaining 34 were eventually allowed to return to their homeland. <clears throat> Scholar Eric Taylor notes, insurrection is shown to have been one of the only viable options for resistance open to slave rebels on ships, in spite of the seemingly overwhelming array of obstacles set up to defeat it. Surely the loss of home and longing to return home, the place of, of comfort and belonging, motivated acts of resistance during this time and would continue from one generation to the next. I argue here, that there was absolutely no barrier that could account for the captive's desire to maintain their identity as people deserving of freedom. The idea and the hope of it is something that they held on to. For the African descendants placed in the position of subjugation as enslaved, there is an opportunity to redefine the meaning of life in opposition to this perceived status of social death and then to affirm personhood. Consider Frederick Douglass, one of America's most well-known enslaved men who escaped slavery and became an abolitionist. Douglass rejected social death status as he affirmed the humanity of African descendants in his speech. What to the slave is the 4th of July? He presented the limits placed on African descendants, ones that relegate them to the status of the socially dead, non-person within the white supremacist paradigm. He says, are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in the Declaration of Independence extended to us? He goes further to reveal the privileges that he and Blacks did not enjoy. He stated, the rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought light and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. Shifting his attention to establishing that indeed, the subjugation that occurs is of one human over the other. He assesses the purposes of relevant laws. Must I undertake to prove that the slave is man? That point is conceded already. Nobody doubts it. 
the slaveholders themselves acknowledge it in the enactment of laws for their government. They acknowledge it when they punish disobedience on the part of the slave. There are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia, which if committed by a black man, no matter how ignorant he be, subject him to the punishment of death. While one, only two, of the same crimes will subject a white man to like punishment. What is this but the acknowledgement that the slave is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being? The manhood of the slave is conceded. It is admitted in the fact that Southern statute books are covered with enactments forbidding under severe fines and penalties the teaching of the slave to read or write. When you can point to any such laws about the beasts of a field, then I may consent to argue the manhood of the slave. When the dogs in your street, when the fowls of the air, when the cattle on your, on your hills, when the fish of the sea and the reptiles that crawl shall be unable to distinguish the slave from a brute, then will I argue with you that the slave is a man. Douglas boldly pointed to the hypocrisy of white supremacy by describing the practice of enacting laws that can only govern people and not animals. Does Douglas succeeds in reminding his white listeners that the privileges they enjoy and the rights that they have ascribed only to themselves are an act against humanity. From Douglas, we can see that social death status has much to do not simply with how a person is treated, but how the person perceives the self. As Douglas, a man freed by his own volition when he ran away from slavery, refused to swallow wholesale the ideal of a socially, of social death, non-person by challenging the idea of social death, so did others. Douglas shows that being treated as though a powerless non-human does not make it so. I am going to shift now to a discussion of protests by drawing a lineage of Black women in their intervention in the fight against injustice. This too can go back to forms of protests against acknowledgement of humanity that have been documented through studies of enslaved women such as Harriet Tubman, who led members of her family and her Maryland community to freedom and who participated in the Civil War. Dr. Erica Dunbar Armstrong's biography on Tubman titled, She Came to Slay, provides details of Tubman's personal and public life. There are many other women whose names we do not know, and even more whose names we actually do know. But all of these women resisted white supremacy through protests of various kinds within slave communities. Moving past slavery, daughters of the enslaved organized and built what became known as the Black Club Women's Movement. Beginning almost immediately after the end of slavery in 1865, Black women formed small groups in their communities to address the needs of the race. And of course, there were many. By 1895, they organized on the national level. That should be 1896. One such woman who was a part of this movement is one of my favorite women. Alice Ruth Dunbar Nelson. She was born in New Orleans in 1875 and she graduated with educational training from Strait College, which is now Dillard University, my alma mater. She would go on to join the Phyllis Wheatley Club of New Orleans. And she became not only a founding member of that local club, but she also became recording secretary under the presidency of Mary Church Terrell when these women got together to form 
the National Association of Colored Women, NACW, which still exists today. By then, she had published a collection of fiction, essays, and poetry about New Orleans. And she also began her relationship with the famous revered poet, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. The relationship ended formally in 1906 with his death. At that time, she had left him four years before because of uh, domestic abuse and began life anew in Wilmington, Delaware, where she would go on to marry two other times. By the time of her death, she had been a longtime teacher. She had started a hospital when she was in New Orleans. She had um, taught at several schools, including one for black girls that she helped to start through her um, local club. She started an NAACP chapter to um, keep the film, um, I'll think about the title in a second, but um, it was a film about lynching. So she wanted to keep the film from being shown in Wilmington, Delaware, and they were successful in doing that. And she was also head of several other organizations. She was an active member of the suffrage movement and continued strongly in politics, demanding passage of an anti-lynching bill, which to this date has still not been passed in the United States, but she remained until her death in 1935, steadfast in working with politicians to try to get that bill passed. She is known as a fiction writer, a columnist, a speaker, and of course, as an activist. Moving forward to the 21st century, we continue to see black women organizing in protection of the race through a series of protests. The most well-known at this moment may indeed be the Black Lives Matter movement, which addressed the disparity of convictions in the deaths of African descendants by whites. Black community activists Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi established a hashtag in response to the acquittal of George Zimmerman, who had killed Trayvon Martin in 2012 in Florida. In response to the killings a couple of years later of Michael Brown, um, who was on his way to college that August, and Eric Garner, a father in New York, protesters responded to a call to action and organized as Black Lives Matter activists. A major tenet of the movement is to deal directly with the threats to Black life by speaking to the value of those lives as human. Their website clarifies the basic purpose of the, mo of the movement. Quote, when we say Black Lives Matter, we are broadening the conversation around state violence to include all of the ways in which Black people are intentionally left powerless at the hands of the state. We are talking about the ways in which Black lives are deprived of our basic human rights and dignity. And even more recently, we cannot underestimate a Black girl's tendency to simply care about other Black people. In 2020, Darnella Frazier, a 17-year-old high school student, was walking to a store in Minneapolis, Minnesota. In front of the store, the police had detained a black man whom she did not know. She and her nine-year-old cousin stopped and Frazier felt compelled to record what was taking place. That video, which she posted on her Facebook page, would ignite protests across the nation and other parts of the world in the middle of a worldwide pandemic. It would also be evidence in the trial against the officer, whose name I will not mention here, who was eventually fired and charged with three counts related to the murder of George Floyd. And we know the outcome of that as we wait for sentencing. Several weeks ago, Frazier, 
stated the significance of acknowledging an act of violence on the stand when she told the prosecutor that she saw her father, her brother, and her friends, black men and black boys, in that black man whose murder she witnessed. PEN America, a free speech agency, gave her an award for her bravery. The award was presented virtually by Spike Lee, but we know that no award can ever soothe the troubled spirit of a girl who was forced to bear witness to the taking of a man's life. Indeed, racial trauma is the consequence of anti-Black violence, and it has been since the Middle Passage. How do you move past the pain of trauma that is designed to keep a person stagnant and merely surviving through a series of negotiation with one tragic and traumatic experience after the other? Perhaps we simply do not, at least not as long as there are people who insist on seeing Black people through the lens of the Middle Passage. We must then continue to press forward, to run but not get weary, and to demand a transformation of consciousness of both individuals and of white supremacist systems. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Green, for um, painting that picture for us of the history of Black protest and the significance of it. Uh, so we're going to dive right into our Q&A. Um, and I want to start with what is a very basic question, one that I think that you have already answered very well, but uh, I, I want to make sure that our audience really hears it. Uh, and it's the question of why black people protest. So often it just gets attributed to, oh, oh they're angry or um, just acting out essentially. Um, but you've made it clear that it is really so much deeper than that. So can you just restate for our audience the heart of why black people protest? Um, we protest because of the treatment of being treated like um, of being seen as as, um, as laws have shown that are against us from one generation to the next, from one century to the next, that we are non-persons, that we are not people, that we don't have any humanities. We are simply bodies that um, have to abide in some way. And when we move outside of whatever those rules are, um, that is usually perceived as an act of resistance, an act of protest. You know, it's it's interesting to me that when we look at the history of, of America, um, there's a very distinct, in, in my mind, difference between how uh, black forms of protest and, and European American forms of protest are uh, defined. Uh, there's a tendency to label Eurocentric protest as revolution, as uh, protestation. Um, in the case of the Boston Tea Party, it's a tea party, not a, a revolution or, or revolt. Uh, while it seems that black action is given more negative terminology, it's a revolt, it's a riot, it's an insurrection. Um, so is it just my imagination that that black uh, protest tends to be labeled in more negative terms, or is there a reason for casting it in a more negative light? Well, certainly, again, that comes down to a historical perception of 
black people as um, having to fit into a very narrow set of um, limits. And so if we think back to laws that said, well, we can't read and write because it's dangerous. I mean, Frederick Douglass's 1845 narrative really clarifies the problems with going against those laws that tell us um, that we shouldn't be doing certain kinds of things because there's certainly a knowledge that human beings have intellectual ability, right? So on one hand, that's being acknowledged by the laws as he's saying, but on the other hand, um, you're not human. So that makes it possible for us to enslave you because that's the only worth that you have is as a body. And so because we have always been perceived and within this, this um, narrow tension between humanity and non-humanity, which brings us to this idea of being non-persons, again, moving outside of that is something that humans do, but we've never been allowed to do it. So, <laughs> so that becomes the problem when we do something that we, that's the fear of America. And I, I don't think that we can ever underestimate that real fear. I mean, that's what I'm learning as of late and, and that I've been writing about. It's that there is a true fear of Black people. You know, we've had that conversation a, a few times over the past couple of weeks about the nature of that fear and the, the conflict that it creates in uh, this constant, it seems, attempt to essentially force these definitions of what it is to be Black in this country. Um, and it's always that definition that's based in that sense of fear. It is uh, from the period of slavery, it's you know being subordinate and being non-human to uh, the post-slavery era, to being essentially incompetent and not capable of, of carrying out the rights of, of full citizens, to needing to be policed, uh, and ultimately to the criminalization of, of Blackness. Um, and you talked about that historic definition of Black people as socially dead non-persons. Um, and I'm curious to hear more from you about um, that, that basic fight for definition as we are human. Um, it, that seems to be so much at the heart of, of what Black protest stands for is just saying, we're casting off these other definitions because we are human. We are, uh, uh, we have rights to the same inalienable rights as, as everyone else gets. Is that your understanding as well or? Right, well, certainly, um... I really think, you know, going back to Black Lives Matter and having to say that is the ideal of saying we are human. Mm -hmm. And that sort of is the basis or the foundation before we can get to anything else in terms of what we have the right to and our rights and so on and so forth. If, if people in positions of power, people who are privileged do not, and that's their privilege, is that they are perceived as human and we are not. And it it's, it's, sounds simple for us to say that, but it is so complex because it is so deeply rooted in the history of this country that there are people who honestly do not see us as human. So, um, you know, trying to fight for these other things, the starting point is always, I'm asking for this because I am human. Just leave me alone because I am human. I mean, it, it, it just really starts with trying to establish something that seems so simple to me as a black woman. Mm -hmm. But I just saw a poll today that says seven out of 10 people do not believe that that man who was officer at the time, that he is actually guilty. That's 70%, the 30% <laughs> of the people asked do not believe 
that he was guilty, that he took the life of a human being who was pleading for his life. And even a nine-year-old girl says, get off him. Mm -hmm. It's the question of humanity. Yeah, I, I find that so powerful what you're saying and, and going to the, uh, the Black Lives Matter principles and, and guidance. Um, there's a, a frequently asked questions and it's it's interesting that we're diving into this part of the conversation now because we just had a session um, talking about uh, two books for the uh, Live Black Experience reading series. And this was actually a, a question that separate from even thinking about this conversation, um, I posed um, uh, as, as an audience member for that conversation was referencing the Black Lives Matter frequently asked questions. And one of those questions is, uh, but don't all lives matter? And their response is uh, yes, and our, uh, our underlying principles call us to recognize the inherent worth and dignity of every person, to promote justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, and to work for the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. But at this time in history, a spotlight is being projected onto serious issues of systemic injustice toward Black people specifically. Our principles call us to support this cause without negating the value of other causes. We need to break from the either or mentality and embrace both and understandings. Uh, and to the point that you're making, I, I think that is a really interesting uh, sort of divergence in, in thought processes that we as we're fighting to just be seen as human, um, are also saying, you know, we, we see the value of all people and we just want to be recognized as having that same value. Where on the other side, there seems to be this either or. Uh, we can either, it seems to be maintain power or accept that these other people, Black people have the same rights. Um, do you see that that divergence of thought processes, and is it really a power struggle that we're we're battling against? I think power has something to do with it because um, you know, within societies, people feel as though they have to give up something, and of course, in some ways, you do because if in my city, for example. Um, in Greensboro, North Carolina, in however old Greensboro is, and however old um, the the um, the government, however long the government has been set up, there was there has only been in that history uh, one black woman to be mayor, mm -hmm. one black person to be mayor, and so that meant that a white man was a mayor, right? <laughs> and so then that that disrupts the the um the power structure and so then what happened is that she lost when she went up for re-election and a white man became mayor look at what's going on in georgia look at what's going on in texas and i've told people this years ago in greensboro um because of what happened in in alabama in the senate race there i said that black women are going to be under attack by certain kinds of laws that are going to keep us from being able to vote. And so we see the results that's clearly related to the protests that happened um, during the summer. And so now we have these ridiculous laws that again are connected to humanity. Anytime you have a governor who closes the door while white men only have been invited to stand there while he is signing a law to disenfranchise black people to keep them from being able to vote while there's a photo of a plantation in the background no one can tell me that that doesn't have to do with humanity first but also humanity's relationship to this um addiction for power and the right to it because that's how that set up from the very beginning so no you know it's 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 not easy to be able to separate those two but for me the major question is first and foremost is to establish 
um, the fact that I am human. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, throughout history, we see national revolutions and, and freedom struggles that are based in the assertion we have the right uh, to be free from oppression. And in America, we see this spelled out in the opening salvo of the Declaration of Independence, uh, which states that when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate or the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Uh, and when we look at black protests, uh, my question here is why is it so hard to accept that the same claims ring true? Uh, that especially we're not calling for dissolution, but for reform. Um, and only calling for the same self-evident truths that are stated in the declaration. Why is that so hard uh, to accept as, as a broader society? Again, because the U.S. was founded on the myth, um, to go back, you all talked about James Baldwin earlier, he talks about the myth of white supremacy. And so the U.S. is founded on the myth that um, white men were superior first and foremost. And so um, black people were not considered under that or, or um, African people. And of course that's during the time of slavery. And we know that some of them actually owned um, slaves. Um, they owned people. I don't like using that language. They own people. And uh, we also know that native Americans most certainly were not included in that either. And so that's why it becomes necessary to cast that lens and to say that they bought into the myth of white supremacy, that white men were superior and that there could it was impossible for anyone else to be equal to them in any way that mattered. Yeah, you mentioned uh, part of the struggle being an addiction to power. And we had a question come into the chat asking, is it addiction to power or a false sense of being? No, it's an addiction to power. I honestly, <laughs> I intentionally use that language. I do believe that um, white men in particular in this country um, except for those who have decided to ask themselves some questions and, and to sort of pull back from that. But addictions are an everyday struggle. So um, the best and brightest person may still fall into that addiction and crave to take just a little bit of whatever it is that makes them feel um, good that makes them feel just a little bit more superior than the other person in the room who is not white male or maybe even another white male, but but they're not of the same class. They're not, you know, I'm in academia. And so there, there are classes in academia. There's the Ivy Leagues, there are um, classes within state universities and um, so on and so forth. And so it it is an addiction. I, I just can't see um people tearing down <laughs> i mean what happened on january 6th is just absurd to me because i can't see black people never would have been able to get away with that but these people were so mad and I, i'm going to connect this back to the fact people keep don't say this but a black woman with an indian mother became vice president of the United States of America. And it just so happens that <laughs> not soon after on January the 6th, they tear down and kick in windows um, at the state Capitol to stop this from happening. It wasn't just about Biden. It wasn't just about um, Trump and, and him feeding that addiction, okay? It was also about what would be lost if the um, person feeding that addiction is not there. Mm -hmm. And this is the way that people act when they are addicted to something. They just they do things that are illogical. Right. 
They, they can be violent. They will do horrible things. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened on January the 6th. So I'm sticking with that language and that idea. Uh, you know, one of the things that I struggle with so much in, in this conversation and in looking at this subject is just looking back at American history and the establishment of America as an independent nation. And, and part of that independence was uh, calling it the great experiment and saying that um, it, was, it was written right into the Declaration of Independence that um, governments must change to redress evils, abuses, and usurpations. Um, and it, it just seems so contradictory. And I know that you talked about the, the fact that it's because it was based in this idea of white supremacy that, you know, we can fight each other, but we're not going to have Black people telling us that, that, that we have to change these things. But it seems like it should be arguable that uh, historic and modern Black protests are only asking for the same thing uh, and calling on America to abide by its own rules, um, to adapt to the same need to redress wrong that led to our own Declaration of Independence as a nation. So uh, again, I, I, I think I'm just struggling to, to see why there is such a, an inability to see the connection between those forms of protest and that you know, we're, we're just asking for the country to live up to that promise that where it is starting to do wrong and starting to have these laws that are contradictory, then we need to change them. Why is that so, so difficult? Because I think that the, those who frame the constitution and, and um, who were in positions of power, white men, um, that they had already established that they were men and that they had rights. I don't think that the question for them had to do with their humanity. Mm -hmm. So we are in some ways fighting something very different because we are saying um, we are human. What difference does rights make in some ways when somebody gets one of us black black people in case anybody <laughs> when i say us or me or so i'm talking about black people so i don't always say that but that's what i'm talking about um gets pulled over even in um a uniform saving this um somebody who's serving this country right gets pulled over it's not a question of for me, and I don't. It, it, looking at that video, it's not the question of of rights. It's the question of humanity. This man was afraid that he was going to be killed, so he didn't want to move. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the shooting that just happened in Virginia. He's holding his hands up with a phone in his hand. You know, we keep seeing this over and over. Put your hands down. One person shouting, put your hands down. Somebody else is shouting, open the door. Somebody else is shouting, do this or do that. And the person is too scared to move because they are going, it, it's very possible that they will be killed. Mm -hmm. And that's the intent, even when they survive the shooting. So it doesn't become in that moment a question of rights as much as it is, do you see me as human? and not as criminal, um, an animal, all of those other negative things that do not equate to humanity. Yeah, I, I keep also going back to just that fact that, you know, words matter. And you gave the, the definitions uh, that were historically placed on uh, Black people as being socially dead non-humans or non-persons. Non um, Again, looking back at the distinction and the terminology that's used for Black protests versus European or Eurocentric protests. Um, and again, it, it just strikes me that there's this historical positioning of Black struggle for equity and justice as, in essence, trying to, the framework that's been put around it is that we are essentially trying to destroy uh, America and its systems. It's this us versus them thing. And that for us to be seen as human means that we are trying to tear down everything that America stands for. Uh, so what does that say about the relationship of 
this nation to black civil rights, if that's the case. And I'm also interested in hearing your thoughts on, on what that says about America's systems, laws and so forth. Uh, if that is the perception that to change them is to destroy it entirely. Well, certainly um, Barbara Smith wrote an article that was in the Washington Post about white supremacy and defining it and talking about um, government systems and so on. So we know that there is a problem with the way in which policing is um, set up in this country. You know, the at the federal level, they're trying to deal with that with the George Floyd um, bill that is being debated. But it's a white supremacy, it's, it's a system that is set up on white supremacy. So we can say that what we should do is recruit more black people. Um, what if we have diversity training? What if we do all of these things? But what does that do for this system and the way in which it's set up? And so that's the problem is that if a system is set up in a certain way, then adding some people or taking some people away does not necessarily address the problem of the system. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what we're dealing with. We're, we're looking at the roots of systems within this country and you know that's why I ended by saying that there has to be a transformation of consciousness, and that's a process. But we have to acknowledge where the real problems lie before you can actually solve those problems. It's like one hundred and one conflict resolution. What really is the problem that we're trying to solve here, and what do we want the outcome to be? Uh, so I'm I'm really interested in the timeline and the historical tapestry that you painted for us of black organizing and activism um, from the time of slavery through our modern area, particularly by black women. Um, you defined it at one point as the protection of the race. And so I, I want to ask, why is it so important that we recognize the work of historic and, and modern Black activists, uh, and in particular, as you defined it, the work of Black women um, as fighting to protect life and insist on our humanity. So in her book, um, When They Call You a Terrorist, um, Patrice Kahn Colors talks about in every chapter that she learned through reading and study, particularly from the the, um, the certain kind of high school that she went to. She learned from reading and studying people in the US and different parts of the world, what they were doing and what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. And she became influenced by those readings at a very young age. It helped her to understand what was going on around her and her brother had mental health um, problems that weren't being properly addressed by the system. Um, the kind of policing that was happening in her community that was going unaddressed, but it certainly was not unseen by the poor black and brown people of her community. And so, studying the past, as we saw with, for example, the Black Panther Party, those folks did not just sort of show up and say, we're going to start an organization here, but they built on many other kinds of organizations and theories um, from the U.S. and in different parts of the world. And so we often find that um, people didn't just show up to the table and say, this is what we should do and become successful at doing it. That there was some strategy that went into it, that they were building from what other people had done and learning about what didn't work, which is extremely important um, to build their platform um, and how to coalesce and to have partners so that they were not just limited in their goals, but that they could address 
um, more goals than they might have had in mind if there were just one or two people who, who didn't know what was possible. Mm -hmm. So that's why it becomes important to know that history. Yeah, speaking of you know learning from the past and, and learning what worked, what didn't work, I think we, we can't have this conversation without looking at um, the constant calls for Black people to change the way that we are protesting. Um, over time, we've seen these shifts and uh, with slave revolts, it was actively taking up uh, the cause to, to liberate themselves, to insist on their humanity, and those being put down in, in just, I can't think of another word than to say savage ways where not only was the rebellion stopped, but then people were you know, beheaded and that sort of, of activity later. Um, and it just seems that over time, as we have adapted and, and learned other tactics of, of uh, uh, fighting for our rights uh, and and protesting. Uh, when we march, we're too loud. When we stand together, we're dissenting. When we kneel, we're being disrespectful. When we write, we're just whining uh, and so forth. So I ask this question somewhat tongue in cheek, uh, but it, it's a question that I think we need to be confronted with is what is the right way uh, to protest? How are we supposed to, or what What are the lessons that we're taking over time to figure out the proper way or, or the way that's finally gonna break through to show that, that change is needed? Yeah, and there's never been a right way. So even if we look at the civil rights movement, then they were highly criticized. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing what they endured and how they trained themselves to do the work. I mean, it, it takes a lot, quite a bit of, of, of um, patience. And then they, some of them, many of them also went to training like Rosa Parks, for example, to, um, to know what to do when somebody pours hot coffee on you. Oh, oh you're here because you want a cup of hot coffee? Well, here, here we go. Um, or to be spat upon and not swing. Um, it's amazing to me, and I, I can say that because of stories that I've heard in the years that I've been in Greensboro, North Carolina, what happened at Woolworths in um, 1960. And so even <laughs> enduring the pain of sitting there and allowing coffee to be poured on you, um, you weren't supposed to be there, so that was an offense. Mm. So there is no right or wrong way. And when it got to the point of 2020 and people began to see that there weren't just black people, and that depended on the city. And I'll talk a little bit more about that next time um, I make my presentation <clears throat> because I have interviewed um, protesters in North Carolina and asked them, who did they see when they went out to protest? Some of them only saw black people and some of them saw a few white people. Some of them may have, have noticed that there were um, a few Asians as well. So they saw diversity. Again, it depended on where they were. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is that all of this stuff had to happen. George Floyd had to be killed in a public way for people who weren't black to actually say enough is enough. Mm -hmm. So was that enough to be able to say that's the proper way to do it? No, of course not. Mm -hmm. There's that criticism is always going to be there for anybody who's protesting about anything, especially black people. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also the argument that the uh, it's made often when it comes to uh, fighting against oppression, that the oppressor does not have the right to define the response of the oppressed to their oppression. And I wonder how you respond to that statement. Uh, and how do we address or respond to the seeming ri rising scale of, of Black protest from passive resistance to boycotts to revolution and so forth? Uh, I think really the heart of the question there is, is it surprising 
to see this so-called escalation um, when we've been in this battle for, for so long and trying all these different things and, and seeing that, you know, this is where it's going. Well, certainly the oppressor, um, because it'll, it, <laughs> what kind of protest would it be? I mean, as, as soon as you made that comment, I started thinking about back to um, the organizers of the um, March on Washington. And, and so then we have these conversations that was in 63, we're having these conversations. They were having conversations with Robert Kennedy who, um, you know, certainly was very vocal in, the, in his expectations of what that would be. And them trying to compromise with the um, Kennedy administration. And so, and speaking of privilege, they have a president whose brother is the uh, attorney general of the U.S., for goodness sakes. Um, so you're definitely in trouble when you're having conversations with people who have um, a lockdown on the system. So, um, no, the, the protests will never be um, what is expected. What has happened in some cities is that whether people got permits or not, um, but people can track who's in charge of what's going on by looking at Instagram and Facebook um, and um, sometimes on Twitter, social media, that the city officials were reaching out to the leaders of those organizations and saying, um, or whether it was an organization or not, sometimes it was, sometimes it wasn't, and and saying, um, you know, what can we do? We'll we'll be out there. We'll have a presence, but um, we'll stand back. We'll just make sure that there isn't any anti-protesters out there or something like that. And so that's, you know, I think one of the best ways if the oppressor is going to be involved, if, if, if um, that system is going to be involved, that they ask the question of how can I help? What can I do? And not tell the person what to do, because that's that's not the proper way to um, to do it. There is, uh, or there was an article in National Geographic uh, last year, I, I think it maybe came out around October, um, or it, it might have been during the summer, uh, but it notes that people observing the protests of uh, 2020 have searched for comparisons to the chaos of, or what this article called the chaos of 1968. And it says the roots of 2020's events go far deeper into the last hundred years of American history and focused on three major waves of uh, nationwide protest. The 1910s through 1930s, highlighted by the Red Summer of 1919, uh, the fight of fascism abroad and racism at home through the 1940s and 1950s, and the civil rights era of the 1960s and early 70s. Uh, the article notes that the escalated response mirrors a festering history of violence and brutality uh, and a unique solidarity in today's protest that may suggest a more universal bend towards justice. Uh, and this article obviously had some uh, problems of its own. It, it referred to um, the civil rights era as, as chaos. Um, it talks about, um, it frequently refers to violence and kind of as a side note was saying that, I mean, mostly it was it was peaceful, but some devolved into, into violence. Um, but overall, in, in talking about the escalated response of protest as a response and a direct reflection of that festering history of uh, white supremacist violence and brutality, I'm wondering, is, is this a trend that should give us hope? Uh, is it a trend that should give us pause or is it a mixture of both? Um, I would never say that there's hope in violence um, because somebody has to you, lose their life. Uh, and certainly in the history of Black protests, whether it's in writing, you all talked about Richard Wright earlier, Native Son. Certainly throughout his work, we can always see that there is some sort of Black martyr, um, always a Black man. So um, who who dies in a violent way, 
to make a point to change society. And that's why he's called the father of protest literature. So um, I would certainly not say that, that uh, I would welcome violence. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back to France Fanon who talks about the, um, the significance of violence when it comes to the relationship between the oppressed and people who um, are the oppressors and that the oppressed tend to act like those who are doing the oppressing. So so that's where that, that idea of violence comes from, mm -hmm. that they strike out because they've been struck out against in some way. So, um, I think that that relationship is always going to be there, the relationship between violence and nonviolence. And it's unfortunate, but um, but it, it certainly, when we look back um, historically and politically, there is too often a presence of violence. Uh, you were talking about the uh, perceptions of those who participated in protests uh, in, in recent history of whether or not there was diverse representation um, at those protests. And that was uh, really more of where this article uh, from the National Geographic seemed to be suggesting that hope existed in that um, they were saying that their perception was that the protests of today are seeing more uh, diverse representation at those protests, that it's not just Black people saying uh, Black Lives Matter or calling for the view of our humanity, but that we're being joined by uh, uh, Hispanic and Latinx people, by Indigenous persons, and even by uh, uh, white co-conspirators and, and allies. Uh, do you think that's an accurate reflection of what's happening now, or are we still, uh, is it as diverse as, as folks are presenting it as, or are we still seeing this um, split between our call for our own humanity and this push that seems to come from the other side to say, you know, we can't do that because it, it always seems to become this it's either this or that. We can either uh, recognize you as, as fully human or equal humans, or we can meet the needs of some other group. Yeah, and I'm in the South, and my research area is mostly um, specific to the South. So it, it's difficult to know when I look at, when I saw who was standing outside, um, when the verdict was read, I saw a lot of white people in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but that's probably more reflective of the demographic. I know when I lived in Flagstaff, when we wanted to get anything done, so let's, for example, the Murdoch Center and working with the city to make sure that it didn't get sold, um, that was black and brown people working together, probably white people too, but I just, I don't remember. I just remember black and brown people at the table. So if I'm leaving any white people out, that's not intentional. But, um, and when we started up the NAACP chapter, reignited that at the time, there were white people that were involved with that as well. We had to um, get membership. So people were at least willing to um, donate the, the um, time. One of the officers was an older white woman also. So, um, but then again, the demographics of Flagstaff, Arizona are much different than the, the demographics in um, Greensboro, North Carolina, and Charlotte, North Carolina. So um, the people that I talked to and interviewed were for the most part college students. Um, but one of the first people that reached out to me was a white woman. So I'm um, a white queer woman who had grown up in Kentucky and had been um, favored, sort of adopted into a family. I don't, I'm not gonna get into that now because I'll save that for, <laughs> for um, the next presentation. But in any case, it depends. Um, I think that interracial, uh, multiracial coalitions have always existed. If we go back to the abolitionist movement, um, for those of you all who saw the film on Fred Hampton, um, 
we know that the Black Panther Party certainly had um, coalitions and that, that was not uncommon during the Black um, Power Movement and the Civil Rights Movement, not as much, um, but we did begin to see the, the white Christian population and some white women show up. They did in Greensboro, North Carolina at the, um, at the Woolworths counter as well. I've met several of those white women because um, there were only like eight black students at the college, woman's college that's now UNCG. So, um, so certainly historically we will find that um, as a movement goes on in particular that coalitions are formed that bring in people who are not just black people um, and who may not be the age of the younger people. I mean, there were older black people who marched as well during the, um, the protests that happened during the summer also. Again, I'll talk more about that next time, but yeah, there's, there's certainly diversity. Uh, when we talk about the um, the importance of of organizing when it comes to protest, um, I I know you just said that you will talk about it later, but I I, I want to go back to that statement of you know it's not just the young people and it's not just uh, black people who are who are part of these uh, movements, uh, but I want to focus on. Uh, in particular within the Black community, that, that idea of organizing. Um, you talked about the women's groups that organized um, historically and, and the development of the NAACP um, and, and all of this work that goes into it. Um, I guess my, my question there is just um, how important is it for us uh, within the Black community to recognize the importance of uh, organizing together, forming those coalitions and, and um, bringing those multitude of voices to the table um, to make this change. Is it a situation where uh, we're trying to avoid uh, relegating any particular groups to certain tasks? Is it something where we see um, that, that uh, we need different uh, levels of, you know, the history that that older members of the community can bring, um, the enthusiasm that younger uh, members of the community can bring, um, and recognizing how all of those different things work together. Well, you know, um, protesters, they're protesters, they're organizers, they're activists. Um, protesters may be the ones that hear about something and they go out um, maybe to a couple of rallies and they go home. That's what they do. Organizers are ones who have organized the events and all that entails. And activists, um, and an activist may be a protester and an organizer, but activists are the people who, um, like Alice Dunbar Nelson may be in various areas. So she may be organizing something or she may just show up to be the speaker. Um, she may be the one who is getting other people to the event, but she may not actually be going to it. Mm -hmm. And she's consistent over maybe even over her entire lifetime. Alice Dunbar Nelson was. She started off when she was 20 and when she died in her 60s from heart problems, she was an activist that entire time, okay? And so we find that historically with a number of black women, um, a lot of people know the name. If I said Mary Church Terrell, then you would know that she was one of those people who was constantly doing um, something throughout most of her life as well. So. Um, certainly, Black people um, show up in ways that may not even be um, ways that are recognized as being in one of those categories. So who, who's running Black churches? So you might have a man who's in the pulpit, 
um, because we still tend to operate that, you know, only men are called to do this, that, and the other. But um, the person who's making sure that things are flowing is the woman. So much of our activism happened in churches so that if there were children who needed to be fed, who tended to be the ones to make sure that they got fed mm -hmm. or if their clothes looked tattered or if they needed to know about hygiene or whatever those things were, all of it fell under the umbrella of advancing the race, lifting as we climb, which is um, comes up um, Black Club Women's um, Movement motto. So, um, you know, it could be any number of things that black people, but my research has more to do with black women were doing. For the past three days, um, I'm, I'm a member of Delta Sigma Theta. Uh, I'm a black club woman. And I'm a um, co-chair of social action for my chapter. Mm -hmm. So, I've been sitting and listening to black women all over the country who have been involved in various things through their chapters in their communities, stuff I've never even heard of before. So we don't even always know what black women are doing to hold down our communities. We have no idea, but you can best be assured <laughs> that if there is going to be some advancement in any way, any sort of progress, when you turn around, you might see a man standing there, but it was a black woman that probably called him up on the telephone and got him to be there so that that event could happen, so that people would show up um, and so on and so forth. Those organizers are there. So um, so yeah, we're, we're in so many different areas doing the work, whether people are aware of it or not. I want to close out with uh, going back to what I thought was such a powerful statement that you made about the necessity of protest from one generation to the next. So I want to close out by posing that question of uh, why is protest today not only important, but necessary? Um, it's certainly necessary because, as I said, as I finished, that we are still seen as non-humans. Mm -hmm. And so for as long as that is a fact, um, not only in the United States, as we saw with the protests that happened this summer, but protests that were happening in parts of Europe, um, England really stands out to me. They have a Black Lives Matter um, a chapter in London, I believe it is. So as long as that is the fact, there will always be need for protest. As long as we are not seen as human, there will always be need for protest. As long as people are being gunned down because they did what they were actually told to do, or they were too afraid to do it because they know that they're seen as non-human, there will always be a need for protest. And people do not get too old to not protest. Um, as I have, have learned, um, some of them who did protests in the fifties and sixties were out those who wished that they had, but their mother told them not to, or they were too, too afraid that something was going to happen, especially because they lived in a small town where they were crosses being burned or whatever the situation may have been. They were out in 2020. So, um, and some people learned from their parents and went out with their parents. So, you know, that history is there and we continue to build from one generation to the next on how to do it, how to do it well, um, because we understand that it's necessary. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Green, for your presentation and for your insights. Uh, before launching into our, our closing presentation, I did want to make sure I asked uh, if uh, Reverend Dr. Bernadine Lewis, if you had any uh, other thoughts or questions or, or things that you wanted to share as part of this conversation. No, my my soul is truly uh, satisfied. Uh, it's, it has been a wonderful 
uh, discussion, very enlightening, um, and a reminder uh, from whence we've been and from whence we, we, we are going. Um, and so I'm just very grateful for today's uh, discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Green. You know, you're in a place that's very dear to my heart. I'm a Bennett graduate. And um, so um, just knowing that you are there in Greensboro warms my heart. So thank you. You're welcome. And of course, Bennett um, College women were involved with the city movement as well. So there's Absolutely. been a lot on that. So, yeah. Absolutely. And um, yeah, a few of those students were are actually and still uh, married uh, to Bennett Bells. And I had the honor of my first, um, the first students that, that as a high school student uh, was the grandson of one of those uh, protesters. So it was uh, a very humbling experience to be able to, to be that close and, and to walk downtown and, and go in that space and mm -hmm. to hear from um, those protesters that experience. So thank you for keeping us reminded because we cannot forget um, from whence we've come. So thank you. Mm -hmm. cool. All right, well, we will close out with our uh, presentation to let you know what is coming up next and what you can expect from the uh, Live Black Experience presentations uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, coming up this Wednesday, April 28th, we will have a session called Growing Up Flagstaff, the South Side and Making of the Rio de Flag documentary. Uh, this presentation will examine what it was like to grow up in Flagstaff and why it was important to come home and explore the South Side's Rio de Flag issue through the lens of a camera to the beat of music. Uh, giving this presentation will be Mr. Lawrence McCollum, a filmographer, videographer, editor, and Flagstaff native, and DJ 001, a DJ mix artist and producer who is also a Flagstaff native. That will be coming up this Wednesday, April 28th at 6 p.m. Uh, Mountain Standard Time, AZ. The Live Black Experience is dedicated to fully engaging the community in all aspects of the Live Black Experience and facilitating community dialogues regarding it that lead to mutual understanding, respect, and reconciliation. Uh, we're asking that community members take a few minutes to complete the survey uh, that's linked on your screen and posted to the chat. Uh, and by taking that survey, uh, you are helping us to continue to provide the community with relevant and timely programming. And finally, if you enjoy the programming brought to you by the Murdoch Community Center, we ask you to consider helping us to, to continue that work with a monetary donation. You can do so by following uh, the link below, which is also in the chat, or scanning the QR code on the screen. And as a reminder, the Southside Community Association is a nonprofit 501c3 organization. And so in closing, uh, we just want to say to our audience, thank you for joining us. Thank you for learning with us. Uh, Dr. Green, thank you again for your powerful presentation and for engaging in this conversation with our community. Uh, we hope that folks will continue to uh, come back, learn with us, engage in this uh, age old uh, practice of protesting, uh, which we will continue uh, until the day that, that our nation recognizes the humanity of, of all Black people. Uh, and we know that this learning process is an important part of that work, uh, that we cannot understand the necessity and the importance of protest without understanding the history that has led to its necessity uh, and the historical boundaries or uh, barriers that have kept us from being recognized as full humans within American society. So we thank you all those who are joining us uh, both near and far uh, nationally and internationally to participate in this conversation. Uh, we thank you for your time. We thank you for your engagement and your learning. And until next time, 
We wish that you will be blessed and be well. Thank you.